Welcome back, fellow mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. This is going to be part two of talking about cancer-related cachexia. In the last video, we talked about definitions, about criterion, about some of the, at that time in 2023, possible pathophysiologic mechanisms of how cancer-related cachexia is formed and some of the vicious fetal cycles. In this part of the video series about cachexia, I'm going to talk about what these researchers are proposing in terms of therapeutic strategies on how to reverse cancer cachexia. They give a couple of examples of drugs, supplements, and other modalities. And then I'm going to do my best to respectfully tear their recommendations apart bit by bit. So without further ado, let's get into it. So let's take a look at what these researchers in 2023 talk about as being preventive and therapeutic options for cancer patients from their perspective. In recent years, there has been an increased interest in finding proper prevention methods, management strategies, and therapeutic approaches for cancer cachexia. Finding optimal cancer cachexia treatment remains under debate as cachexia is a systemic multi-organ syndrome with multiple associated metabolic and inflammatory components. There is a huge need for a multimodal approach to these patients, combining pharmacologic therapies with physical exercise. Drug treatment of cachectic patients follows a very complex approach with multiple substances being cited as possible therapeutic strategies. Corticosteroids, that would be like prednisone, dexamethasone, methylprednisolone, showed good effects in terms of preserving quality of life and body weight. However, their use is restricted to end-of-life care due to high rate of side effects with prolonged use. A single use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs has not demonstrated to enhance nutritional status or metabolism, but if taken in conjunction with other treatment modalities, may prevent cachexia development. In the case of corticosteroids, unnecessary administration is advised to be avoided due to frequent adverse effects. Antipsychotic therapy was also proposed as a therapeutic option for cancer cachexia patients with beneficial effects on decreasing inflammation. Gastrointestinal hypermotility drugs improve appetite loss, while anamorelin hydrochloride, a drug that promotes ghrelin like actions and increases GH secretion and appetite, was also cited as a possible therapeutic strategy. Currently, the first nutritional care strategy advised for increasing oral nutritional intake is the use of oral supplements, ONS. In addition, icosapentaenoic acid or EPA administration was related to improve quality of life, decrease PIF production and muscle degradation. L-carnitine coenzyme Q10 and branched amino acids showed beneficial effects in terms of decreasing protein degradation and anorexia. Exercise was also cited to be a promising strategy to prevent cancer-related cachexia as it was related to increase muscle function and strength, decrease fatigability, and improve quality of life. In addition, exercise induces anti-inflammatory effects and improves muscle anabolism and function. Time is also very important when treating cancer cachexia as early diagnosis and therapeutic interventions are key factors for improving patients' overall conditions and outcome. This raises awareness of the importance of identifying specific biomarkers for the early identification of patients with high risk of developing cancer-related cachexia and thus proper intervention and management of these high-risk patients. All right, let's kind of tear apart this last piece in particular. The mechanisms of cancer cachexia is still ongoing, and I still have more to share about the, how everything ties into cancer-related cachexia. But I want to talk about some of the therapeutic strategies that these researchers talk about. So the use of glucocorticoids, what is a glucocorticoid? Effectively, it is a cortisol mimic. What does cortisol do? It breaks down muscle tissue and increases fat, increases blood glucose, increases gluconeogenesis. I think corticosteroids would be the worst possible therapeutic intervention you could do for a patient with cancer-related cachexia. Not only is it showing that they have advanced disease, which means it's highly glycolytic, they already have, as discussed previously, insulin resistance, hyperglycemia, increased gluconeogenesis related to muscle protein breakdown, lactate, et cetera. So why would I want to give them something that's going to further break down muscle, which is known to do with corticosteroids, break down bone, and also increase their blood glucose? It also impairs immunity. So I think this was probably the dumbest thing I've ever seen 
as being a therapeutic strategy. I understand that glucocorticoids, as well as NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which we're talking about right after corticosteroids, are a way to reduce inflammation. But it's the wrong way to do it, in my humble opinion. If it was my patient, I would want them to steer the hell away from corticosteroids in this particular case. Now, some of these like peptides that are affecting ghrelin and GH, I, I don't know no, enough about them to really comment, although I don't like the idea of in, increasing growth hormone, which is a obviously growth hormone, which could have pro-growth effects on the cancer itself. So I'm not sure I would be super excited about that. And I can tell you that EPA and DHA, the fish oils they talk about that help prevent muscle degradation and improve quality of life, they also have a cancer mortality decrease. So by taking fish oils or having you know, foods with omega-3 fatty acids, such as EPA and DHA, that can decrease your quality, your cancer-related mortality as well. So I'm very uh, bullish on the EPA, DHA. I'd probably be okay with uh, L-carnitine as well, because that's going to enhance your ability to burn fat and um, you know, basically be on a ketogenic diet. But CoQ10, not a huge fan of. Um, it is a powerful antioxidant and has been shown to kind of prevent ferroptosis. So I think that that would be probably not a great idea. Um, branched chain amino acids, that's the leucine, valine, isoleucine. Those are powerful anabolic amino acids. And I just don't think that would be a great idea for patients with cancer to give branched chain amino acids. Now, do I think that having protein in your diet is going to be important? Yes, but I, I would not personally want to be giving people branched chain amino acids or, or hydrolyzed proteins that are already broken down or amino acid supplements, because I think it's going to probably cause more harm than good. But I see what they're saying with that. Um, and then I think, you know, when we actually look at the best recommendation they could have for patients, other than maybe this EPA and DHA, the omega-3 fish oils, exercise is going to be clearly, clearly a huge part of the, the help to mitigate and also reverse cancer-related cachexia. And we're going to talk about that in the coming slides. I hope you enjoyed this part of the cachexia video series. This was probably one of the more frustrating parts of the articles for me to read. When I saw that bit about using corticosteroids or prednisone or dexamethasone or whatever they were recommending as possibly being part of a therapeutic strategy, I just imagined myself like on a thumbnail going like this, like complete face palm. And you know, the fact that they were even considering using steroids or considering using CoQ10 as a possible strategy or some of these branched chain amino acids, which are highly anabolic, it just goes to show really how little they understand about what the strategy is for overcoming cancer as a whole. Because even if you are able to somehow put weight on a patient or increase their muscle mass somehow with some of these interventions, you would be losing the war because you're providing the substrates necessary for the cancer to actually grow and get worse. So that's not what we'll be talking about going forward. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about some of the revelations that I've had when looking at lactic acid, glucose, gluconeogenesis, glutamine, etc., and how that sets up the vicious cycles of cancer-related cachexia and give some more meaningful strategies about how to mitigate and reverse it in a manner that is much less harmful and very likely hugely beneficial. So if you like videos like this, please like, share, and subscribe. And until next time.